welcome to my presentation. Uh, it's entitled From Part to Post um, Complex Mold Manufacture Using Fusion 360. I'm Guy Bottle. I'm an implementation consultant with Autodesk Global Consulting Delivery Team. Um, I deal mainly with our subtractive portfolio, um, our subtractive advanced manufacturing portfolio, namely Fusion, uh, Power Mill, Power Inspect, um, and Power Shape, delivering projects to mainly automotive and aerospace customer accounts. Uh, helping them to optimize workflows and adopt automation where possible. All right, then let's start with a bit of an agenda of what I'm hoping to cover today. We'll start by looking at the general process overview. Our part that we're going to be using today is this motorbike mudguard mold. You can see a relatively complex component, deep cavities with some complex geometry couple of 2D and 3D features and some, some hole drilling in there as well. The, the aim of today is to take you through a, a full workflow from part to post as the, as the name of the presentation suggests on the, some kind of tips and tricks and some high level suggestions on how to get the, the most out of Fusion 360 and the manufacturing workspace in particular. Uh, you can see on the screen the rough overview of the workflow that we're looking at covering. I'm going to start by touching on AnyCAD. We'll then look at some tips to do with setting up your component with Infusion. Uh, we'll then move on to some CAM, looking at various design for manufacture techniques, and then look at some roughing and finishing toolpaths. We'll then move on to validating our programming. We'll look at simulating our simulating the toolpath and then inspecting using surface inspection inside of Fusion to make sure that what you're cutting is is what you're expecting. I'll then look finally at how we post NC code. I'm not going to show you the NC code. That would be that would be boring to look at on the screen, but I'll show you some of the the features that we have in Fusion to help you uh, post in the in the most effective way possible. So let's start by looking at AnyCAD. So AnyCAD is a powerful collaboration tool that helps to bridge the gap between your design and your manufacturing teams. Um, we all know that last minute design changes can cause real issues in terms of wasted time and wasted money when it comes to the manufacturing process. And we also recognize that as much as we'd love for you to use Fusion 360 for your entire process. We know in a lot of cases that isn't possible. Therefore, by connecting Fusion to a model's native CAD software, AnyCAD enables any design updates to be instantly pushed back into Fusion to allow the manufacturing team to quickly and easily update, the, uh, update your toolpaths. I've only got an hour for, for this presentation. So rather than sitting and playing you a video of kind of a little bit more in depth of, of what AnyCAD can actually do, search Fusion 360 AnyCAD. There's some great videos that give you a step-by-step uh, -step guide of, of how, to set, so how to set your part up and how to, to utilize AnyCAD within, within Fusion 360. Next, we are going to move on to our setup. So setups include all information uh, regarding your stock material, your shape, your size, the position and orientation of your work coordinate system, your part geometry, and any work holding, any fixturing that you have as part of uh, your, your CAM session. It also enables the user to define their machine tool. This definition of the machine tool makes it easier when, when choosing a post processor and limits the tool paths that are available to you inside of Fusion with the intent of preventing you from programming tool paths that may not actually be machinable using your machine. You'll see as we, as we work through these slides, we've got these top tip flags throughout. Uh, these are kind of the key points that I want you to take away from, from this talk, the, the kind of main snippets of, of information that I think be, will be really useful to you 
uh, to take away and use on your own components. In the post-processor tab of our setup dialog, we have the ability to set multiple work coordinate system offsets, uh, G54, G55, and so on and so on, which enables the efficient manufacturing um, of batches of components uh, rather than needing to duplicate your component within Fusion and pattern all your tool paths to account for this. We can set up multiple work coordinate system offsets in our setup to enable to then machine these components, either ordering the operation, ordering by operation or ordering by tool, which enables us to uh, machine very, very quickly and efficiently and reduce the number of, of tool changes that are unnecessary between different tool paths. We're now going to jump over to Fusion and I'm going to take you through how we set up this component uh, and touch on a couple of the, the different points that, uh, that I want you to take away. So when we create our setup, we can see the dialog is, is displayed. Um, three tabs, these, these work the same uh, with all, all dialogues in Fusion, work from left to right, and you are unlikely to miss any information when setting up your, your toolpath, your setup, um, anything like that. We can start by selecting the machine that we want to use. In this case, I'm gonna use uh, this DMU50. Um, in Fusion, uh, Fusion is shipped with, with hundreds of post-processors post available to you for free already. Um, so we're able to search for the, the corresponding post which matches the machine that we want to use um, in our Fusion 360 post library. Uh, there's a number of different filters that we can we can go by. I know that I am looking for a, a DMG uh, Mori. This this post should do the trick, and um, that post is then uh, is then defined and is linked to our machine. We're also able to define the machine configuration in the setup. So we can define the kin kinematics of this machine, the, uh, the linear and rotary coordinates, um, any coolant, any dimensions, the, um, the footprint of the component, just to have a more complete uh, manufacturing session with inside of Fusion. Um, these, these kinematics are passed through to the post-processor we can then define the operation that we'd like to use, um, milling, turning, cutting, additive setups. We're going to stick with, with milling for this one. And we want to define our work coordinate system as the centermost point of our stock material of this component. Um, where we have it set is OK. Um, however, the, the, the stock that has been defined for us is uh, encompassing not just our component, but the fixture as well. When we go through and select the component, um, that stock material will change. Um, we can define our fixture so that Fusion knows that this is a piece of CAD inside of the session, which we cannot machine. We, we need to not machine uh, collisions with, the, with this piece of CAD are uh, a big no-no. We can then move on to defining the size and the shape of our stock. For this setup, um, I'm going to assume that the stock material that we have been given has already been measured and has been cut down correctly to size other than a, um, a top offset of, let's say, two millimeters um, this, this gives us then the opportunity to face off our piece of material to ensure that we've got a nice square block before continuing with the, the cutting of our, um, of our mold tool. Let's give this setup a name. And we can then move on to the next, uh, the, the next step in our workflow looking at actually programming CAM tool paths to allow us to cut the material. Boundary selection is an extremely useful 
tool when manipulating tool paths. It allows you to be very, very specific in where to uh, where you want your tool paths to machine. They can be created either from existing geometry, from sketches that you've created explicitly for that tool path. Um, they can be based on points, on contours, on surfaces, uh, pretty much any piece of 3D CAD that uh, you can select in Fusion. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of useful things to note. Uh, you can see on the screen, there's two different types of boundaries. The top right image that you can see is a boundary cre created mainly for 3D toolpaths. Double clicking on a contour once you've selected it allows you to edit that boundary and make it either open or closed. Um, and that allows us to be very specific with where our boundary is, is defining. You can select any, any edge, any vertex to, to define and change that, that position of the boundary. On the flip side, on the bottom right, you will see a boundary for a, tool, a 2D toolpath. 2D toolpaths are created and are defined solely by the 2D piece of wireframe geometry that you select. They don't look at the, the 3D model, only that piece of, of wireframe that you select. You can see that there is a, a shaded blue area. Selecting the, the red arrow that is next to the boundary allows you to define which side of that piece of wireframe that you're going to be machining. Obviously, in the case of, of this model, if we were to select the other side, then we'd have a, a catastrophic collision with our component and the component would be written off. But when we move into Fusion, because this is a, this is a training presentation, I will show you, show you what that looks like um, and show you what the, the correct way to do it looks like. So let's jump back into Fusion and face off the top of the block and finish the, the flat contour um, underneath that. So what we are looking at doing, um, blocks of material don't always come as a perfect, uh, a perfect, perfectly squared off. So what we need to start our roughing operations with is uh, a couple of parallel passes to ensure that the top of our block is completely flat. So if we navigate to our facing operation in our 2D toolpaths, we can select an appropriate tool from our, our tool database to, uh, to do this operation. We use a 50 millimeter end mill, nice and wide to ensure that we are removing as much material each time as possible. Our stock contour is defined as the edge of our block. We're absolutely happy with that. Um, all we need to ensure is that we are cutting down a couple of step downs. We left two millimeters of stock on the top of this component. So adding a couple of depths to ensure that our tool is not overloaded and we have a nice, uh, a nice surface finish and a nice flat finish um, when we when we cut is what we're looking for. We want to ensure that we are machining both ways. We're machining with the bottom of our tool, so um, we don't need to uh, worry about climb milling over conventional milling over conventional milling. So we can create those tool paths, and if I turn on the leads and links that can be turned on and off on this bottom toolbar that you can see uh, is a very useful uh, piece of knowledge to know when you start having slightly more complex 3D tool paths. You have lots of yellow link moves in the way. You can't actually see where your tool path is cutting. Um, this relatively new feature gives us uh, a little bit more visibility. So we have our facing tool path that you can see cutting in multiple depths down to that face. The next operation that we need to look at is machining this flat here. So what we can do is use this 2D pocket operation. Um, I'll speak to you a little bit more about roughing the differences in the roughing operations 
later on. But this 2D pocket operation can be used for both a roughing and a finishing toolpath. The, the finishing, uh, it's very useful for finishing because it offsets the uh, shape of the contour that you define, um, offsets that outwards to give you a nice consistent toolpath. Let's choose this 25 millimeter um, tip radius bull nose tool and define the geometry that we want to uh, that we want to cut. We're going to use this bottom contour here, like you saw in the in the image earlier. Uh, it selected the correct side for us, but what I'm going to do is show you what it looks like when we cut this side before I before I switch it back over to, to the correct geometry to machine. Let's increase that step over slightly and increase the tolerance. We've got a, a finishing tool path. We want to tighten up the tolerance. Um, we don't want to leave any stock on, uh, on these passes. We just want a nice smooth set of tool paths. And you can see that Fusion has no problem in creating these tool paths straight through the model. If I was to turn off the model, um, you'd be able to see that that contour has been offset outwards to allow us to um, keep those smooth offsets. Obviously, this isn't what we're looking for. What we want to do is flip that and machine this side um, really, really useful feature of these 2D toolpaths, uh, even though we have this really large recess in the middle, because the 2D toolpaths aren't looking at the, the 3D CAD geometry, um, they will ignore what is above and below that plane and, and just machine in that singular plane. And give us a nice toolpath to uh, to machine that flat face. Next, we're going to compare the differences between the, the two main roughing strategies that we've got in Infusion. Both pocket and adaptive clearing can be used in 2D and in 3D. Pocket clearing works, as you saw in that previous toolpath, by offsetting the defined boundary to create the toolpath. It's used mainly with high feed insert cutters with removable tips um, where a small step down is necessary, but a step over of up to the full tool diameter can be used. Uh, it's very useful as a, as a 2D finishing strategy because of that offset as a contour, as I said. On the flip side, um, adaptive clearing uh, maintains a constant tool engagement throughout the entirety of the tool path. The aim is to remove as much material as quickly and efficiently as possible. Essentially, adaptive clearing aims to maintain constant tool engagement throughout the tool path while still limiting the load on the tool to prevent tool breakage. This is especially critical when you're machining into very tight corners. There's nothing worse than machining into a tight corner and then changing direction very quickly, machining uh, very large volumes of material in one pass and uh, running the risk of snapping your tool. Adaptive clearing also allows for separate engagement and feed values for climb and conventional milling. Um, this allows you to really improve your tool life and improve your surface finish. And adaptive clearing is used mainly with solid tooling, as you can see in the image on the bottom right. Um, the aim is to cut with a, uh, a depth of cut of up to the entire flute length of the tool, uh, but obviously with a, with a very, very small step over that varies depending on the, uh, the radius of the cut that's being taken, the amount of material that needs to be removed. Which one you use will solely depend on the application. Um, I always suggest to kind of program with both. It's very, very easy to keep the exact exact same settings for your roughing strategy and just create a pocket clearing and adaptive clearing 
and then compare them, have a look at their properties, see which one machines fastest using your experience, see which one looks like the, the kind of roughing strategy that you think will be most effective for, uh, for the geometry that you're cutting. Uh, a very useful piece of functionality that goes alongside roughing um, is the, the shaft and holder collision avoidance options that we've got in Fusion. Collisions when manufacturing are obviously some of the worst things that can happen uh, during machining, especially when your machine tool and some of the tooling can be extremely expensive to replace. This shaft and holder collision avoidance um, checkbox it can be found in the tool tab of your, uh, of your toolpath dialog. Um, it has a number of options to ensure that you aren't going to collide your shaft or your holder with your workpiece. We've got pull away the top image, which as the name suggests, pulls the toolpath away from the workpiece to maintain the user defined shaft and uh, holder collision distance that you have defined. Trimmed will remove any unsafe segments. It will trim those away and leave you just with the safe segments of the toolpath. Obviously is useful in some, um, in some senses, but uh, there are other applications where you want to machine as much of the uh, material as possible. You'd rather pull the tool away and then go back into those areas with a slightly smaller tool or at a different angle. Um, trimming can sometimes make that, uh, make that cleaning up slightly harder. We then have number three, the bottom of these three images, the detect tool length. Um, Detect tool length is very useful when machining large cavities. Um, it automatically extends the tool to the length that is needed to, uh, to maintain that specified clearance. Obviously, if you're uh, cutting, you don't want your tool to be too far out of the holder. Uh, you can cause vibration and deflection of the tool, but it's a useful tool in understanding how long your tool needs to be uh, to, to cut the entirety of your part. We have the final option, which doesn't need an image, but fail on collision. If we're not able to, uh, if Fusion isn't able to machine the, tool, uh, the component safely, then the calculation will be aborted. Rest machining, as the name suggests, can be used to uh, machine the rest of the material that's left after your first roughing operation. Um, rest machining is especially useful uh, as it can remove large cusps left over to prevent large variations in force when you uh, start to use smaller tools to remove those last little pieces of material. In some cases, multiple rest roughing passes uh, are very useful to remove materials from, uh, from tight corners. In Fusion, we've got three different uh, rest machining adjustments that can be used in different circumstances. Uh, I think this is a useful one to touch on as the, the tooltip in Fusion doesn't give you kind of the best information. Um, and because rest machining can take a little longer to calculate, the calculation time is, is longer than other, other tool paths it's useful to understand what each of these adjustments actually do before you jump in and wait for your toolpath to calculate. So use as computed, the first option varies the step down and the step over to suit your part geometry. It guarantees a safe toolpath, but may not always be the most efficient. It may cut areas that don't need cutting, but you know the toolpath is gonna to be safe. Ignore cusps obeys the defined step over that you've defined in your passes tab, uh, which means it may calculate faster, but that does mean that it runs the risk of the tool colliding with uh, any additional stock that may be left over after your uh, initial roughing pass. It's very useful for, for parts with, with tapered walls. And then we finally have machine cusps, which again def uh, obeys the defined step over um, and if there are any cusps left at the end of a Z level, they'll be machined at the end of that Z level before 
moving down to, to the next said level. It guarantees that all stock is machined, but uh, the trade-off of that is that it does take longer to calculate than users computed, for example. The machine shallow areas option in the passes tab is a perfect accompaniment to rest machining. Um, it's very useful in limiting the size of, of the cusps that you have left over after each machining pass. However, it is very dependent on your geometry. In production, machining all the cusps on a component can really slow down machining time. If you take a look at the image in the bottom right, um, it may not always be necessary due to the geometry of your part and the geometry, geometry of your cutter. It may not always be necessary to add those intermediate passes. You may spend time uh, going back and creating very fine step downs to machine those cusps away only to have the next major Z level machine that exact location again. So you may have just wasted, although it may only be 30 seconds, if you're uh, producing parts on a large run, then that's going to add up. For more free form parts or parts with very tapered walls, large time savings can actually be made by allowing cusps. So turning machine shallow areas off due to the, the geometry of the, of the part, uh, the Z level, the preceding Z level can in, in a lot of cases, remove those small cusps and prevent, prevent the need for those step backups to remove that material. This is most applicable when we're using high feed cutters. So uh, insert cutters such that they use small step downs and due to the geometry will then remove those cusps with the preceding Z level. So let's move back in to fusion and take a look at some roughing operations. We want to remove as much material from this main large pocket as possible. And we also want to remove material from both of these back two pockets with the intention of moving in with a smaller tool afterwards to rest machine and then semi-finish and finish, um, which I will, I'll move on to later. Let's start by creating an adaptive roughing strategy. We want to look at using relatively large tool um, Obviously, adaptive roughing, we can uh, take quite large step downs. Uh, so we should be able to machine this entire pocket in five or six step downs. Um, and you'll see the, the shape of the toolpath that is created to, uh, to limit the load on this tool. This stock contours option here um, allows us to define and tell Fusion exactly where um, there's material left that we want to machine. Um, as we've already machined this top face here, we're gonna limit the area that we're gonna machine, the limit the, the location of where we have stock left to this, uh, this pocket. We're also going to add this same machining boundary uh, using selection and selecting that same, uh, that same contour. We're going to allow the tool to move outside the boundary so that we can come down outside of this pocket and move in rather than spiraling down, ramping down into the center of this material and applying unnecessary load to, to our tool. We're going to add an additional offset of 30 millimeters. We've got a 25 millimeter tool so we want to leave a, um, a slight bit of wiggle room to, to allow the tool to come outside of this boundary um, before moving back in again. And we are gonna turn rest machining off. We, we know that we only have material left inside this contour, so we don't need to look at any previous operations. Next, let's define some top and bottom heights to ensure that we uh, do not create any toolpaths that are going to um, touch our already 
machine surfaces. We're going to select the top height and bottom height of this pocket. And we're going to increase the roughing step down and increase that fine step down a little bit. That fine step down being the smaller step downs between the major Z levels that uh, the fusion will create to allow us to remove um, those larger cusps to make them slightly smaller. Uh, this becomes very useful when we look at moving on to um, rest roughing afterwards. We will leave uh, 0.3 millimeters of stock on all of these surfaces to allow us to go back in and, uh, and finish effectively. We can then calculate that. And you can see just how quickly uh, that roughing operation has been calculated. If I turn off our leads and our links, you can see the, uh, the, the main Z levels and those fine step downs between those major Z levels that the tool is going to step back up to remove, especially on these, uh, these large walls here to remove uh, extra material where we can. You can see that we have a couple of quite tight corners in here. So a useful thing to do is to create a rest roughing operation to allow us to remove some more material out of those corners. I'm also going to uh, create another roughing operation on both of these pockets. The reason I uh, didn't create the uh, roughing operation to do all of them at the same time is uh, it allows us to define different top and bottom heights for both of these. Uh, as we don't want to machine anything above this Z level here for this toolpath, um, creating them separately just allows us to have a little bit more control over the roughing operation. However, what we can do, uh, because we've spent the time fine tuning the uh, fine tuning the operations and fine tuning the information that we want to use for this roughing operation what we can actually do is create a derived operation which inherits all of those same properties into a new toolpath we can do uh, we can use derived operations to create um, other operations that are in the same category so for example a 3d toolpath if we create an adaptive clearing toolpath, we can create a derived operation on any of these toolpaths, but we can't take 3D toolpath uh, information and create a, a derived operation as a 2D toolpath. So the only things that we want to change for, uh, for this second roughing operation is the, the boundary. So we're going to select the boundary around that pocket and we're going to select the boundary around that pocket. Uh, we're also going to do as we did last time and select these as the stock contours and then change our top and bottom heights. So we'll select our top height here and we'll then select our bottom height here before we uh, calculate and rough out our two back pockets. I know I said to you uh, when we were back in the, the PowerPoint that some rest roughing operations can take quite a long time. Um, I've done some pre-planning and already created our rest roughing operation so that you don't have to sit and uh, wait for me to, to calculate this. So let's copy that into the, um, into the setup that we've just created. And you can see when I click to edit, this small uh, lock feature here um, means that our tool paths have been locked, which means that they can't be invalidated with any changes to geometry. Um, obviously, one of Fusion's 
Uh, one of Fusion's real benefits, one of its real strengths is that we have CAD, CAM, a number of other workspaces all in the same software, which makes it very easy for us to switch back to CAD and make any edits that we need to make before switching back into our uh, CAM workspace. But for the sake of this, I will um, invalidate it just to show you some of the, the options that we've been using. We've used the, the shaft and holder pull away option just to ensure that we aren't colliding with our, with our holder just due to how deep our pocket is. Um, in this instance, we, we, have, uh, we are looking at rest roughing all three of these pockets. And we've reduced the maximum roughing step down and the fine step down um, just a small amount alongside having a slightly smaller tool, a 12 millimeter bull nose, uh, bull nose as opposed to a 25 millimeter bull nose. Um, but what we have done is left the stock to leave exactly the same. The whole point of a rest roughing operation is just to machine uh, areas of the model that have stock left, um, have more stock left over. If we were to reduce the stock to leave on our rest roughing operation, um, the time to calculate would be much, much more. And you then end up machining the entire model with a smaller tool, which could cause tool breakage, massive wasting, massive time wastage. Um, so leaving that the same allows us to just just remove material in hard to reach areas that the the larger tool couldn't reach let me cancel that and what i'm going to do is we are happy that we have faced uh finished that top face roughed this pocket roughed those back two pockets and created a rest roughing operation what I'm going to do now is select all of those and protect them just so that we don't have to worry if we make any edits to a geometry, if we move back into the CAD workspace, um, we know that we're not going to have to regenerate all these tool paths again. We're happy that these are ready to go. Um, if we want to make edits, you saw how easy it was to unlock and, and make those edits. The next, um, the next tip that I want to, to walk you through um, is related to stock models. Obviously, in practice, in your machine shops, you may well have a machine tool that is dedicated just to roughing or a machine tool that is dedicated just to finishing of your parts. So a three-axis machine just for roughing, uh, stiffer, less chance of, uh, of, of vibrations and doesn't need to be quite as accurate as it's just removing material as fast as possible. Using stock models can help machinists in accurately programming finishing toolpaths by enabling the roughed stock that is left after the roughing operations to be used as the starting stock for their finishing passes. Stock can be uh, exported as an STL mesh, uh, as an STL mesh, as an STL mesh at any stage of the simulation. For this to work, the mode, the simulation mode, must be set set to standard. I'll walk you through how we uh, how we do that now. We know that in our um, in our um, in our workshop that we have two of the same machine. One is just dedicated to roughing. One is just dedicated to finishing. So what we're going to do is make a duplicate of that first setup. We want all of the, the same options to be, um, to be maintained, the position of your work coordinate system, um, the, uh, the location of your fixture, the, the size of your stock, um, or the, sorry, the size of your model. The only thing we're going to be changing is uh, the stock that we use as our starting stock. Obviously, in our roughing setup, we had a square block of material. But in our finishing setup, we want to utilize um, the 
the state that the stock material is left in after this final rest roughing operation. So if I go in and simulate our toolpath that we've already created, we can face off that top. We can then finish that, um, that second flat. We're going to then, uh, I'll speed up, speed it up a little bit. We're then going to rough out this main pocket. We're going to rough out those back two pockets and we're then going to rest rough all three of the pockets to remove uh, material in those hard to reach areas. You can see in yellow down the, uh, down the fillet, um, down that flat face, uh, down that curved face. This is the state of the material that the machinist running the finishing machine are going to be receiving the, uh, receiving the model. So if we right click and navigate to stock, we can save our stock as uh, an STL mesh. So I can save this anywhere. I can save it to my desktop um, as stock.stl. We can save that. Um, this is where this is a, a point where, where it's very important for us to remember to protect any of the toolpaths that we don't want to spend time um, recalculating. As soon as we navigate back to the design workspace and make any changes to the CAD whatsoever, regardless of if they uh, affect the areas of the model being machined, um, they will need to be the the toolpaths will need to be recalculated. So what we can then do is import a STL mesh. Uh, I've already imported it. We have our rough stock here as an STL mesh in the state that we want to um, in the in the state that we want to uh, move on and finish the component using. So moving back to manufacture and selecting our finishing setup, we can then choose uh, to choose our stock from a solid, and we can find that solid, select it, and then I'm going to hide it just because it's not very nice to look at a. Uh, uh, an STL mesh with lots and lots of triangles. We can OK that. And now you can see the um, uh, the slightly see-through stock material there has the cusps left in the positions that we'd expect after the rest roughing operations. The associative nature of Fusion 360's CAD and CAM work, workspaces can really improve your toolpath control. Whereas previously, if you needed to create a, a surface to improve your toolpath, to drive your toolpath, to prevent tools from dropping into holes that you didn't want to machine with that specific tool. You would have to import CAD geometry from an external CAD software into your CAM workspace, into your CAM session to program these toolpaths. Being able to switch between CAD and CAM with a, a click of a button makes the creation of these extension drive surfaces, these capped surfaces, much, much easier. Surfaces and holes can be capped to prevent small tools from dropping into them. Surfaces can be extended, which is what we're going to be looking at in the next toolpath, that top right image that you see, to give you uh, much more control over extensions of your boundary. If you remember, we um, in Fusion, we could define our boundary extension in the roughing operation. We chose that as 30 millimeters, but that is 30 millimeters in all directions. What we can do using these cap surfaces is then manipulate the boundary that we're going to be using just to be extended in given directions to allow us to ensure that the tool has enough room to run off of the surface that we're machining. So as with, um, as we did with this rough stock, we could very easily move back to the design workspace. And what we can do is the toolpath that we're going to look at creating next is a finishing toolpath, which is going to scan backwards and forwards along this fillet surface um, to machine it using uh, a ball nose tool. What we can do very, very easily using the surface machine, uh, the surface modeling infusion is 
extrude these surfaces uh, to extend them out slightly further to ensure that we have enough runoff for this toolpath. I've got one on both sides of this uh, model that you can see. What we can then do is activate the setup that we want to create the toolpaths in and create a contouring toolpath using a, uh, a 10 millimeter ball nose tool. As we did with the 2D toolpaths, we can also um, create 3D boundaries using our selection. Let's zoom in and select the start where we want to start this boundary. This isn't where we want, so if we double click and select again, we can select and start to trace the exact, um, the exact path of this boundary. We don't have to select every single point along the boundary, just some select few pieces of wireframe to ensure that the boundary follows the, the path that we're wanting it to follow. So we then want it to come back this way and it looks like we have the boundary that we're looking for. And as you can see, if I take a view from the top and zoom in slightly, that this boundary is extending just but beyond the outside surfaces here. If we then remove these surfaces from view so that we uh, can declutter our screen a little bit, we can then use this, uh, uh, we can then use this boundary to create our um, fillet finishing toolpath. If we move over to our passes and reduce that step down slightly. And we will machine both ways, not that you would in real life, but just to remove those, um, uh, just to remove those link moves to make it easier to see what the toolpath looks like. Click OK, and you can see that our um, toolpath has been calculated. We don't actually want the, uh, the toolpath to, to push around these corners. So if we re-edit our toolpath, there is an option in the geometry tab, this model tick box. Currently our model is defined just as the, um, the piece of CAD that we defined in our setup. But if we are creating surfaces, cap surfaces, extension surfaces, um, just for a specific toolpath, you need to make sure that they are included as surfaces to be machined in that toolpath. So we need to select extension surface one and extension surface two as the two bodies to be included in that setup model. That way, when we click OK to calculate, those tool, those are taken into account, and they uh, and the the surfaces are machined. Let me quickly turn contact only back on to create that toolpath that we're after. So what happens now if we get a call from the design office and they tell us that there's been a last minute change to our um, the fillet radius of this model. Currently we have a radius of five and a half millimeters. We've programmed our tools and we've chosen our tools to reflect this. Um, it's a situation that everyone runs into in a machine shop. Um, what we're able to do, rather than waiting for an entire new model from the design, uh, from the design department, the, when we know that only one fillet radius is gonna be changing, 
we can move back into the design workspace and we can edit that feature and we can change it to the fillet radius that the new model is going to uh, to reflect the changes from the from the design department. You can now see we've got a much larger radius. And when we move back to the manufacturer workspace, we have a finishing operation that uh, let me clear this up for you so you can see it slightly easier. Let's reduce that one, reduce that one, reduce that one. We have um, a tool path that is now out of date. But due to the associative nature of fusion, the, that toolpath that is out of date, because of how we have defined the boundary to um, encompass this, this fillet, we can right click and we can regenerate. And the toolpath is automatically then regenerated to account for that change in, in geometry. Um, this makes things very, very uh, simple when small design changes like this occur uh, when you're already in the process of programming your part because um, because the, the, there is a, a very simple two clicks and your toolpath can can be regenerated for to account for this. The next few pieces of functionality that I want to talk you through are all related to the manufacturing extension. The manufacturing extension is a number of pieces of functionality that are much more geared towards advanced manufacturing processes to allow you to really utilize your CNC machines when manufacturing complex parts such as mold tools. The first piece of um, functionality I want to look at, although this is a piece of functionality that uh, is used it can be used without the manufacturing extension. I think it does relate quite nicely to the, the, the finishing tool path that I'm going to speak about next. This contact only tick box is found in the geometry tab and controls whether the tool path that is created, uh, that's where the tool paths are created when the tool is not in contact with the machining surface. So let's take those back pockets, for example. We are likely going to be drilling those holes after we've completely finished the component. But we don't want to machine around the holes. It's more time than it's worth and will likely cause the pattern of the surface is going to reflect the, the shape of the toolpath. What we ideally want is the ability to just machine straight over the top of those cap surfaces. So when disabled, the, the toolpath is extended to the limits of the machining boundary that you've defined. And it's extremely useful, as you can see, uh, when you compare the bottom image here to the top image, uh, extremely useful in, presenting, uh, in preventing small tools from dropping into those pockets. And it's also very useful, as I said, in creating smooth toolpaths over the top of these recesses. This can be used alongside the new toolpath, relatively new toolpath, was introduced to the manufacturing extension last year, um, steep and shallow machining. Steep and shallow machining strategy is a semi-finishing uh, semi and a finishing strategy that compounds two toolpaths together into a single toolpath to allow you to machine essentially any piece of geometry. It brings together the contour toolpath, which we used for that fillet for the steep areas, and then either the scallop or the parallel toolpath for the shallow areas. The steep and shallow threshold angles uh, can be defined. So depending on the geometry of your part, you can define at what angle the contour strategy transitions into the parallel or scallop strategy. And there are a number of other useful pieces of information, uh, a number of other useful tick boxes and features that you can use alongside steep and shallow that now makes it, uh, even from the time that we brought it out last year to now, makes it a much more useful toolpath. We have the ability now to machine in multi-axis using steep and shallow. We're able to define the tool axis, not just as vertical now, 
but as a number of other options. The first being lead slash lean. So defining an angle from the vertical that the tool is tilting out to the side away from the part and also tilting towards the direction of travel or away from the direction of travel. These are very useful when you are machining with a bull nose tool. The one dead spot on a bull nose tool is the, the point right in the center of the ball. So you always want to try and avoid cutting with that, that center point of the tool where the, the effective speed of that point is zero. So you're essentially gouging with that bottom point of the tool. You can also use to slash from a curve. So you can define a sketch curve that you want to have the, the tool tip pointing towards, or you want the back end of the tool to be pointing towards. And then you can do the same as that with, with a point in space. We also have the ability to define a, uh, an override tilt angle. So for any areas that can't be machined safely using the defined tool axis method, uh, we can define this override tilt angle to specify a, prefer a preferred angle at which to machine those areas. We also have the ability to turn on collision avoidance in this tool path, and it enables you to tilt the tool axis based again on these tool axis options that I've just spoke about, vertical, lead lean, two from curve, two from point. And there's also an automatic option which can be used alongside the vertical tool axis option to automatically tilt the tool away from your component. We're now gonna use steep and shallow finishing to finish this component. Again, because of the size of this component and the, the calculation times needed for uh, steep and shallow finishing, I have created the tool paths already so that we can, uh, so that we can take a look at exactly uh, what this tool path is gonna do. This is our, um, toolpath that we're looking at. This, this toolpath allows us to uh, machine the entirety of the component. There's a number of options within the uh, passes tab that really allow you to manipulate the, uh, the position of the tool. The first being this continuous checkbox that is available in the steep pass and the shallow pass. Um, reduces the number of lift moves between passes to reduce your machining time. Um, we also have these other two checkboxes available in the, the scallop mode of shallow finishing, smooth offsets and remove cusps at junctions. So let me show you what that looks like. You can see on this shallow area here, we have, uh, we have a number of offsets. You can see that we have a continuous tool path that's been turned on to uh, enable us to keep the tool in contact uh, throughout this entire, um, this entire shallow section. We also have these curved off apexes. Um, if we were to uncheck that option, these apexes would have been um, a lot more, uh, the, 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 the corners would be a lot more prominent. And if you think about that in terms of the speed and change of speed and direction of a tool, um, having a complete point means that the tool needs to come to a complete halt, a complete stop, change direction very rapidly to then move in a different direction. And what that does is because of physics and how, uh, how physics works, you're never going to be able to have uh, the tool to, to stop completely dead still before changing direction. Uh, what that's going to do is cause deflection of the tool. Even though it's very minute, it still has an effect and will be visible on the, on the component. And it also affects the tool life. Um, deflecting the tool... Um, is gonna cause uh, more chance of breakage and is gonna reduce the surface finish on your part. 
Um, you can also see these, this tool track that traces between each of the vertices um, that um, remove cusps at junction checkbox uh, is the reason for this tool track. And what that does is because of the changing um, geometry of the component, you're never going to have a constant step over between each of these vertices. So what that is likely to do is cause cusps of different sizes between your uh, between each of your passes. So one final trace along all of those vertices, you can see that up here as well. Um, one final trace between all of those vertices will ensure that no cusps are left after um, after your scallop passes have uh, have been created. Let's take a look at our tool path with a vertical tool axis. The tool path looks good uh, to begin with. We, as we get through the simulation, uh, you notice along our timeline, we have a number of red, uh, red lines, points on the tool path. If I scroll those forwards, points on the tool path that you can see the tool is going to collide with our stock material due to the fact that the tool is vertical and we need a tool holder. Uh, we can't machine this component vertical unless we have an extremely long tool, which is then in itself going to cause issues in terms of um, deflection and poor surface finish. So what we can actually do is in creating this, it was the exact same as we did with the roughing strategy, create a derived operation. And rather than using a vertical axis, we are using a um, the primary mode being from curve. That curve is defined as a sketch that we've created in space above the component. Um, Depending on your component, there is going to be a, a little bit of trial and error to to figure out the best um, the best tool axis tilting mode and the best shape of the curve to use to uh, to create your uh, to create your tool path. If you can imagine this um, this pocket here is going to need quite a few changes in um, in tool tilt to machine these surfaces on the right hand side to machine these surfaces on the left side and also on this side we can't we can't maintain a, a constant tool axis for the entire of that component so if we simulate this tool path we can see that the tool changes direction throughout the entire tool path to ensure that we aren't going to have any collisions um, when machining the, uh, the surfaces. The final machining operation that we need to undertake to finish this component is to drill the holes in the back plate. The manufacturing extension, uh, functionality in the manufacturing extension, hole recognition has now made that much, much easier to machine parts with large varieties of whole shapes, whole sizes, whole orientations. Obviously in this instance, we've only got three different types of holes and one orientation, but you can imagine base plates and much larger molds than this could have hundreds, if not thousands of holes of different shapes and sizes. As you know, programming holes, especially in high volumes can be very, very tedious, time consuming, having to program each individual segment of your hole, your spot drill, your counter bore, your counter sink, your plunge drill can be very, very difficult and time consuming, not only in the number of clicks you have to take, but also in having to measure each of the holes and understanding the size of tooling that you need. So using Fusion's inbuilt sample tool library, the whole recognition functionality can quickly obtain the optimal tools for the program which then allow you to either map those tools to tools that you have in the workshop or order new tools that you might need. So in the milling uh, tab at the top, we have two different types of drilling, our standard drill 
and our whole recognition. The whole recognition would be grayed out when you don't have access to manufacturing extension. Um, so previously, what you would have to do is select a whole, define each of the operations that you needed. Um, if you had multiple holes of the same, you, you were able to select holes of the same diameter. So if I was to select that hole, uh, you can see that the um, the hole on the other side was also be selected. But again, if you have hundreds of different types of hole, that is going to save you time, but it's going to be uh, minuscule in the grand scheme of things. So using automatic hole recognition, what we can do is select and Fusion will scan the model, find the holes, and give you options of which drilling cycles are needed. There are a number of different um, pre-shipped drilling cycles that come with, with the manufacturing extension, but for holes of kind of non-standard sizes or non-standard operations, you may need to create your own drilling templates, which is super easy to do. Um, as I showed you, the, the three drilling operations that we we're gonna use to machine this hole, the spot drill, the deep drill to get into the bottom of the, um, of the hole, and then the counter bore. We can select all of these, right click and store as a whole template. We can then call this um, spot drill, deep drill, counter bore. Let's uh, add some spaces in those so that it doesn't look like a mess of letters. And we can save that. So now that template is saved in our template library and can be used moving forward to, uh, to be mapped to other holes that are likely to use that same, um, that same op set of operations in the same order. So let's select hole recognition. The dialog box then comes up and the sets of holes which we have, the groups of holes that Fusion sees as the same types of holes are listed along with a schematic. Um, I have this already preset, but um, this is what you will see when opening it for the first time. Pressing this uh, show hole preview gives you um, a schematic and just allows you to see slightly easier what you're dealing with. So selecting each of these will highlight them in the CAD view and allow you to see the shape of each of those holes. We can then define what action we want to use. So we can see that these two holes here are gonna need a spot drill, a drill, and then a countersink to get these chamfers. So we can um, choose a number of different options. Uh, we can spot drill, deep drill, counter bore. We can spot drill, counter sink drill. Um, let's choose the one that we've just, uh, let's, let's choose spot drill, counter sink drill. We then have a plain hole, which is gonna need just a spot drill and a drill of the hole. And then we have another spot drill, counter sink drill. We can then move over to our tool libraries and we can choose either the tools that we have to find in our local library, tools from a cloud library or from our sample, uh, sample tool library. Uh, I always like to use the, the sample tool library just so that I can see what the, um, the optimum tool is to use. Uh, so let's look at uh, using the sample tools in metric. We don't need any taps. Um, and then move over to the options tab. Our options tab can then allow us to define the which of the total number of holes we're looking at. Um, we can find them just by uh, given sets of diameters. If, for example, you have a large bore in the mid middle of a component that you know is going to be turned out or is going to be roughed rather than uh, drilled, you can set the maximum diameter so that Fusion doesn't look at that as a whole. Um, you can set the thread uh, size tolerances. And my favorite part of this is that you can 
order either by size or by the minim uh, by minimizing the tool changes. Um, we can then click OK. And Fusion will create this whole recognition uh, this whole recognition folder, which has every operation that we need to machine all of these uh, all of these holes. Um, if we then review and decide that actually we want to machine these holes last, we can simply drag them and drop them to the uh, the bottom of our. I think we can do that. Should be able to uh, drag and drop them um, to to vary the order. If we're not happy with the depths or the tool for a certain operation, we can go in and edit the exact same as you would with any other operation. We can change our heights. We can go in and change a tool if we need to, um, and then recalculate that tool path, uh, and it's ready to go. The final piece of the manufacturing extension functionality I want to talk you through is surface inspection or probing. It's all well and good creating a component that looks pretty and is programmed nicely on your screen. But if you go to then machine that and you are not able to produce what you've got on your, your screen, then it's, it's wasted effort. Probing can be very, very useful for quality control to ensure our parts are within tolerance at various stages of your manufacturing process. It allows you to prevent wasted time. In-process inspection can, can detect or help you detect whether we need to make edits to a toolpath prior to running them, especially in the case of the time intensive steep and shallow finishing toolpath, which for this part could take multiple hours. And finally, probing can help us understand stock thicknesses that we have left on the part. Unexpected stock thicknesses can then cause larger cutter deflection when we go in to finish with smaller tools. It can cause chatter marks and, and worst of all, could cause tool breakages. Creating a probing cycle couldn't be easier. Navigating to the probing tab in our manufacturer workspace, we can find the probing cycle that we want. We can probe to define our work coordinate system. We can probe certain geometry, but what I want to do is inspect a surface. We can select a probe. I'm happy with this six mil probe at the moment. Um, I don't know what that feed rate is doing as zero. Um, we can then define the geometry we want to inspect. That's as simple as clicking positions on your component to define the points that you want to probe. Um, we can then drag and drop those, the, the arrows uh, that denote the direction in which we're going to probe always stay normal to the surface, which is what we want. Um, and if we're not happy with the position, we can hold control and click, and we can then delete those points. I've already got a uh, inspection strategy created for us here. Once we have created our probing strategy, um, it's worth noting that for a user of Fusion 360 to be able to use the probing functionality on their machine, um, their post-processor needs to be configured for that. Um, I believe we have a few post-processors that are already pre-configured that you can download for free from um, the post-processor library. I believe they are Heidenhain, Siemens, and Fanuc. Um, so once you have run your probing operation on your machine, you have your results file, um, you want to then view your results and find out if your part is in tolerance. So in our probing tab, we can then import our inspection results. You can find the location of the results file. Um, I've already imported mine here. Once imported, the results file will be displayed under results. And this confetti will be displayed throughout your model to allow you to get a visual representation of where on your component is intolerance, out of tolerance. Um, 
we can right click and show those results. And this gives us the nominal and measured, the nominal and the measured points of uh, in X, Y, Z of each of these points, as well as um, the changes in X, Y, and Z between those, and then a deviation and any error that is caused because of that. You can then save that inspection report as a PDF um, for use to, um, to allow you to communicate with your machinists or uh, communicate with a customer the, um, the accuracy of your manufacture. As I've spoken about throughout this presentation, we've gone all the way through, we've got our part, we've worked through the manufacturing process, and we're now looking at post-processing. Fusion comes pre-installed with hundreds of post-processors for many, many common machine controllers. There are many more that you can download for free off of our Fusion post-processor website. As I said in the, in the previous slide, and when I was taking you through the probing, we only have a couple of posts that are already configured for probing, but there are a number of ways that you can get new posts created or you can get your current posts edited. Uh, you can hire a post author from the services marketplace, but that does cost money. You can post on our Autodesk Ideas station. If there's a large enough number of requests and enough information about that post, then the post team will review it. And you can post on the, on the forums. We've got a very active Fusion community and we've made all post processes open source. So the idea is that you can collaborate and work together to edit those posts and to really make them your own and, and help them work for you. The website to download the post is at the bottom of this slide here, cam.autodesk.com slash HSM posts. You can also download from cam.autodesk.com uh, a number of pre-created tooling libraries from various different tooling suppliers and, and probe suppliers. So in summary, what I have spoken to you about today, we've reviewed all the way from AnyCAD, all the way through to the post-processing of code to en enable you to manufacture a real life component. We've had a look at setups how you can use stock models to split your setups to split your setups into roughing and finishing. We've also had a look at a number of different 2D and 3D toolpaths, as well as various methods that you can use inside of Fusion to validate your toolpaths. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of our virtual summit.